Good evening, everybody. It is Mayor Shelley Brindle, and I am here with the crew uh, to, to go over the financials for One Westfield Place. Uh, so we're gonna, before I make the introductions, um, I'm just gonna give a minute and make sure that give people time to join. And then we will, um, and then I'm just gonna give a brief overview on what we're gonna be doing this evening and why we're here. And then I'm gonna make introductions for the panelists who are joining us. So um, just, we've got uh, Jim Gilday in the background who's steering the presentation for us. Um, and uh, Kim Ford is monitoring uh, questions on uh, the Facebook feed that she'll feed to us if it's anything that comes up that we haven't already covered. So with that, Jim, you wanna move on, move to our first slide? There we go. So, um, uh, and really thank you all for joining us tonight. I know it's a busy evening um, in the holidays season, and uh, but we just thought it was really important that we got all this information out to the public so they have time to uh, review it and sit on it through the holidays uh, before we anticipate another Facebook Live on January 11th to do a bit of a follow-up on this. But I just thought it was important to remind everybody why we're here. And I think it's very easy for people to get into questions and the details about specifics of the project. But I also think it's important to take a step back to discuss, to, have, to remind ourselves why we're even talking about this project and how it came to be. Um, and you may remember, because I've said many times back in 2018, uh, we had initiated conversations with what was then just Hudson's Bay Company uh, before the Lord and Taylor closed to ensure the best outcome for Westfield. Even though the store was still in operation at the time, I think we are all very clear and certain on the way the retail world was going and that a big 143,000 square foot standalone department store was probably not gonna be standing in Westfield much longer. Um, concurrent with those conversations is when we um, had began our master plan re-examination to kind of lay out you know, a long-term vision for Westfield with a priority and a focus on revitalizing our downtown. Um, that started the master plan re-examination process. It had a, a tremendous amount of robust public input. Hopefully many of you had participated and that was adopted in December, 2019. Fortuitously, um, and sadly, we all know what happened in 2020 um, and, uh, and Lord and Taylor closed in August, which was, probably a year or two earlier than any of us had anticipated, um, which was accelerated by the pandemic. And the good news was we had already been through the master plan process. So we had a pretty clear blueprint on where we wanted to go as a town. And that, as I said many times, served as the instruction manual for Hudson's Bay, which subsequently bought Streetworks Development to really uh, follow that, what we call instruction manual, to lay out a vision um, for, for our future. And then what that led to in December of that same year, the town council voted to designate HBC Streetworks Development as the redeveloper for not only its Lord and Taylor properties, but as well as for um, municipal lots two, which is the one on North Avenue, the municipal lot three, which is the South Avenue parking lot and lot seven, which is always known as the one across from the parking lot. It's important to note though, that the lot seven one through this process, which we'll talk a little bit about, um, and a while in terms of our engagement with Streetworks and, and trying to get this project to a place that we thought was really the most uh, consistent and delivered on our master plan objectives, we told Streetworks that uh, lot seven was off the table and that the focus was really should be on lot two and three. And we thought we could, those lots were enough to, uh, to really satisfy what we hope to accomplish. Uh, so, um, but it's important to remember, like a lot of people ask, like why the why lots two and three and not just their property. And I do want to remind everybody is that in the conversations with Streetworks, we felt it was very important to take a holistic view of how we could best uh, best support our downtown. And the concern from the get go in the initial conversations I had with Richard Baker at Streetworks, the the vision for the Lord and Taylor property on its own was so compelling and so magnificent, we were worried that it was actually gonna detract and move the gravity of our center of our downtown towards the Lord and Taylor site. So we thought it better to take a holistic view and ensure that the entire town was set up for success so that our success, you know, our success was their success and vice versa. So that was really the rationale behind lot two and three. And it enabled us to kind of take a, you know, mitigate 
any over dense areas in certain parts of town by being able to spread it out a certain large amount of property. Next, Jim. So let's uh, just one going back to what was it that the master plan uh, wanted to deliver on, and then what are the some the key objectives of One Westfield Place? It really is an unprecedented opportunity to partner with our largest downtown taxpayer and property owner to deliver on the promise of Westfield. And again, our priority from the get go was always to create a vibrant downtown while maintaining our town's historical character. Secondly, we wanted to expand and diversify our tax base to ease the burden on residential taxpayers. And some of, may, some of you may have heard me say that uh, 90% of our taxes in Westfield are paid on the backs of single family homes. It's the largest in Union County. We have no commercial tax base to speak of, really. We don't have a hospital. We don't have manufacturing. Um, we don't have a big commercial base. And so when we want to deliver on, uh, quite frankly, a lot of the quality of life amenities that our taxpayers deserve, there's the only way to do it on, is on the backs of residents. And so I think the one thing that we can all agree on is that our primary objective is to managing the tax burden on residents. And that's one of the things, a key objective of One Westfield Place. We also wanted to offer diverse housing solutions, particularly for downsizers. Uh, you know it's a common sight when someone has their children graduate from high school, typically a for sale sign goes on the lawn. Um, these people are not moving to Florida. They're going to Springfield, they're going to Mountainside. They're going to many places because they wanna stay close and connected to the community of Westfield but there's really no options, downsizing options for them. Uh, and that's one of the things that we hope to solve. Uh, clearly, obviously we wanna advance our affordable housing obligations. The next round of negotiations with fair share is in 2025. And we wanna set ourselves up as, as, as good a place as possible for that next round of negotiations. We also hope to resolve our longstanding traffic parking and congestion challenges. You know, we had hosted this traffic Facebook Live not too long ago, uh, and many people talk about the traffic that they're concerned that One Westfield Place will bring, but we have to be realistic and understand that a lot of those traffic and congestion challenges exist today. So we hope to actually be able to use this, uh, use this opportunity in this project to deliver and improve many of the traffic problems that we are all way too familiar with in many, in many of our most popular or unpopular intersections. We also, you know, we have aging infrastructure. Many of you may remember two years ago, right around the holidays in the heart of the pandemic, we had a water main burst in our downtown. So this is an opportunity for us to upgrade aging infrastructure, improve our stormwater management and accelerate many sustainability measures. I think overall in this project, it reduces stormwater management by 30% and it reduces, that improves it by 30% and reduces heat island by 50%. Those are things that would be very, that are not at all remotely feasible on flat surface black asphalt parking lots. We also wanna provide engaging spaces for community gathering, arts and events. Hopefully I, we've gotten so much positive feedback and many of the place making and art, uh, public art that's happened in town and that wants to, that's gonna be a key component of whatever we, this project ends up uh, becoming. And then clearly, as I pre mentioned previously, deliver unprecedented new sources of commercial tax revenue not only to be able to deliver uh, the quality of life amenities that we expect, but to be able to stabilize our taxes for the long term so that, that we have a reliable tax base that will not like hopefully ease the tax burden on our, on our taxpayers going forward. And I also think this is just a really important stat. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about traffic and crowds and apartments and everything, but this is, we've act, we actually have 2,700 fewer residents today than we did back in 1970. And you can see this chart, 1970 was the peak. It dropped precipitously um, in, up in the next decade and it has slowly been going up. But even in the last 30 years, the growth has been very slow. Even with this last census, um, Westfield was the second slowest growing town in Union County and well below the national average. So a lot of people worry about new residents and so forth, but even one Westfield place is expected to add at only 354 residents, still putting us on par with where we were um, 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago, but way below where we were uh, 50 years ago. And I think that's really important to remember. 
The other thing that people find hard to believe, but it's true, um, we have lost over 2,000 employees since 2015. And you're like, well, where could they be? I mean, you can name a few, Lerner David, uh, the law firm that moved to Cranford because there was no adequate office space or um, parking. I met with the managing partner there. They wanted to stay in Westfield. They needed high amenitized office space with 150 parking spots, which didn't exist. Um, we all know Barrasso Consulting, which was bought by Deloitte that had uh, employees all over downtown. They left, I think it was 2016 or 17. Parking was a big reason why they left. Clearly we lost Lord and Taylor and lots of other small businesses have moved. And this is one of the big reasons why we are so, such advocates for office space, because you ask many of the downtown merchants, when those employees left, they lost their lunch business, they lost their catering business. Um, I spoke to a chiropractor after Lerner David lost. They, were, they, they had a lot of lunchtime patients. So these are exactly the types of, um, uh, we need these employees to come back and use their and, and use, uh, use their wallets during Monday through Friday daytime traffic. Our businesses cannot survive on nights and weekends alone. And that's what we're asking of them currently. And so tonight I wanna to introduce you to really, I think our best in class finance team. They are continuing to negotiate a very favorable low risk deal for Westfield with one Westfield place. This has been a couple years in the making. This is a very complex um, uh, project and that, uh, that means the financials are complex too. So uh, it's been, uh, but we have been very significant and big advocates for Westfield. And I wanna start and I'm really gonna let um, uh, Councilwoman Linda Hapgood who was chair of our finance committee do some of the introductions. But I do wanna say, uh, how fortunate we are and the community is to have a seasoned finance executive like Linda running the finance chair. She has had a seat at the table with all of these redevelopment finance executives advocating what's in the best interest alongside them for the for the residents of for the resident for our residents and for our taxpayers. And so I'm looking forward to her uh, contributions tonight and I'm going to hand it off to her to let her introduce who uh, the rest of the finance team. So Linda. Great. Thank you, Mayor, very much. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined the call tonight. We're really excited to have a chance to walk through a lot of the finance details uh, for the redevelopment of One Westfield Place. Um, as the mayor mentioned, um, I have had the privilege of being involved in a lot of the finance discussions, particularly since March. Um, since um, at that point, I left um, a a company that I had owned and run for more than 23 years that was very involved in project finance um, transactions in emerging markets. Um, and even though this project in Westfield um, is inside the border of the United States, a lot of the work that I did over the years um, has really um, helped me to um, get up to speed on the redevelopment law and you know a lot of the discussions that we've been having with Hudson Space Streetworks um, really mirror a lot of the discussions that I've helped my clients with over the um, several decades that I've been um, a, a financial advisor. Um, the other thrilling part of um, this process is the opportunity to work with um, the people that Westfield has been able to hire to advise us and guide us in this process, bringing decades and decades of experience um, to the table on our behalf. Um, and tonight you'll have a chance to meet um, all of them and also have them walk you through a lot of the details of the um, financial aspects of this project. Um, so I'm uh, very glad that so many of you are tuned in tonight and um, that we're also recording it so that it will be available um, for others to view in the future. Um, tonight, we're going to go through a, a lot of um, slides and a lot of information. Um, as the mayor mentioned, we'll be keeping track of the questions. We probably are not going to finish tonight because there's so much ground to cover. So we've already scheduled a follow-up call for January 11th, um, also starting at 6.30, um, where we'll pick up on topics that we didn't really have an opportunity to fully develop or answer tonight. Um, but let me um, walk through for you um, the introductions. Um, I'll start with Bob Powell, who's a partner at Nassau Capital Advisors. He's our redevelopment finance expert. 
Steve Molenik, a partner at Greenbaum Law. Um, he's the legal counsel related to the redevelopment. And Matt Jessup, he's a partner at McManaman, and Scotland and Bauman. He's our bond counsel and also um, a longtime resident of Westfield. So um, in a minute, I will let them go through their bios with you. And then we're gonna start um, walking through a lot of the topics that we know you would like to cover because we've been keeping track of the questions that you've um, sent over to One Westfield Place, the questions that you've sent to us individually as council people, um, and the questions that have been asked at um, council meetings, et cetera. So um, I also um, wanted to mention that it's not only me that's been involved um, heavily in this process as a member of the council, um, but also Mark Parmalee, who is the chairman of our um, code review committee. Um, Mark is also a member of the finance policy committee along with Councilman uh, Parmalee, I mean, Count, Councilman Contract and Councilman Katz. Um, so all of the members of the um, code review and the and the finance policy committee have been, you know, very involved and engaged in this process. Um, and then on top of it, it's real. It's really important for everyone to understand how involved our um, town administrator, who is the encyclopedia of Westfield, um, who knows about you know all of the um, ins and outs of the history of the town and knows the finances like the back of his hand. So he's been. Um, critical in the process, our economic development consultant, Liz Jeffrey, who's been involved with us for, in this process for years, and then our town attorney, Tom Jardim. So all of us have been involved in multiple um, recurring phone, um, Zoom calls weekly. We've had multiple meetings with the, um, you know, with Hudson's Bay Streetworks here in town and also in New York City. Um, and then I've also had the um, opportunity to spend quite some time with the CFO and the finance people at Hudson's Bay, because obviously we needed to ascertain the um, financial wherewithal of a longtime partner that we would be entering into um, this redevelopment agreement with. So on that note, I'll, I'll let Bob and Steve and Matt um, introduce themselves and provide some background, and then we'll get into the rest of the discussion for this evening. Thanks so much. So Bob? Yes, Mayor. Wanna, Good evening. And thank you, Linda. Um, my name is Bob Powell. Um, I'm the senior partner and managing director of a firm called Nassau Capital Advisors. We are based in Princeton, um, and we have been involved for the last 15 years in, uh, as a general proposition, serving as real estate financial advisors for both public and private clients that are engaged in complicated and substantial redevelopment projects, primarily in New Jersey. Uh, my background uh, includes considerable amount of advanced graduate level training in economics and finance. Um, I was the former executive director of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority in Trenton, which is the state of New Jersey's Economic Development Investment Bank. And after that work, I had a 30-year experience um, in commercial real estate development as a principal, uh, focused almost primarily on redevelopment work in several major cities in New Jersey. About 15 years ago, we formed Nassau Capital Advisors to take the expertise that we had in the development world and serve uh, in an advisory capacity for, um, as I said, public and private clients throughout the Northeast, but primarily here in New Jersey. We have represented probably 150 communities uh, doing redevelopment in the state, including many of your neighbors uh, nearby. Um, Morristown, Madison, Chatham, that are also doing some very transformational projects. Um, so with that, with that brief background, um, uh, I will be back to you in a moment, but let me, let me turn it over to Steve Milanic and let him talk a little bit about his background. Well, thanks, Bob, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure representing uh, the town of Westfield, uh, which we were brought on 
uh, way back in 2019, just before the pandemic, uh, to uh, participate in, uh, in this redevelopment process. Um, I am co-chair of our firm's uh, redevelopment land use department, uh, along with my co-chair, Bob Goldsmith, uh, who together we represent the town on this, and other redevelopment in town. Our firm has been around for over 100 years, we have about 100 attorneys, and has a, a long history of real estate uh, representation on both the public and private side. Um, and just as Bob said, about 10 years ago, we had um, split up our departments into real estate and redevelopment, uh, just so that we have a uh, dedicated focus on that area of practice, which in New Jersey has been growing um, just because of the dense population of, of many of our suburban centers like Westfield, and in doing so have represented uh, dozens of uh, municipalities and developers, again, on both the public and private side, on realizing the goals and objectives put forward in redevelopment plans all throughout the state, uh, like, like what's being proposed here with the town. Uh, so uh, I don't wanna belabor uh, it any further. I'll turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Jessup. I am a partner with McManaman and Scotland Endowment, um, and I am chair of our firm's public finance practice group. We are the largest bond council firm in the state. Uh, we bring more bond and note issues to market than um, any other. Um, we represent municipalities, counties, boards of education, uh, parking authorities, redevelopment authorities, water and sewer authorities, uh, literally in every county in the state. Uh, as well as state entities and the state itself um, as issuer of uh, bonds. We also have acted as redevelopment council, both on the public and the private sector side, similar to Bob, on some of the most transformative projects in the state. The Prudential Center in Newark, the American Dream Mall in the Meadowlands, the development and revitalization of Asbury Park and Long Branch, and countless suburban downtown development projects, um, Ridgewood, Princeton, and including projects currently being constructed or opening in nearby Berkeley Heights and uh, neighboring Springfield. So in projects like this, we feel like we come to it from three perspectives, right? From the finance side um, as bond council, where I spend a lot of my time, from the redevelopment side, uh, sort of Steve's chair, where I also spend a lot of my time, um, and then from the private sector side, right? Understanding what the private sector needs, but understanding that we're sort of guardians of a public trust, and it's up to us to sort of bridge those two to make projects um, successful. And as Councilman Habgood mentioned, I am also um, sort of a lifelong Westfield resident. Um, I grew up in town. I'm a K through 12 sort of school graduate. And with the exception of undergrad and grad school and the obligatory stop in Hoboken, I've really uh, lived here pretty much for, for a really, really long time. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. And you forgot to say you're the pride of the South Side, right? Absolutely, Ward four. yes. Ward <laughs> four. I don't want to start a ward battle here, but we know. We have, we have Ward 4. We actually have three of our wards, rep four rep wards represented today on the, on the phone. So um, anyway, so we're thrilled to have you. So hopefully... We wanted to give you a flavor of really the extensive experience that we have really when we say um, best in class, we really mean it. Uh, and I, you'd be remiss, again, the um, with the input of Jim Gilday, as Linda mentioned, also our economic development consultant, Liz Jeffrey, who is also a 30 year Westfield resident and our town attorney and former mayor, Tom Jardine, were all participated in the negotiations. So just wanted you to know who had been involved in all of this. So I think, uh, Jim, on to, I think I'm handing it over. I'm going to, from here, I'm handing it over to you, Steve, to Steve. Sounds Malik. good there. I know, uh, I know everybody watching is, is eager to get into the financials, so it's that time now. Uh, we've split this presentation up, and as you heard uh, Councilwoman Habgood say, this is one of two um, currently scheduled uh, presentations on the financials, uh, part because there's so much to cover, and our part because things are still developing. The preview center is open, people are visiting it, we're having these conversations, um, and there's gonna be more to touch on in, in January. To start us off, I just wanna quickly go through, um, perhaps a reminder to some, perhaps new to others, what we're talking about here, because as we go through the financials, there's gonna be references to, to the project, right? And to the different areas of the project, and specifically the public improvements that are gonna be leveraged out of 
uh, this project as proposed. So here you have on this slide uh, an overall development of uh, image of the proposed one Westfield place project. On the next slide, and starting over the next three slides, uh, you're going to see the, what we're referring to as zones of development. There are three zones of development here is the West Zone, and this is the zone uh, comprised of five separate private components as conceived right now, including the existing and vacant Lord and Taylor buildings. The whole site totals about 7.3 uh, acres, and the proposal that's uh, uh, before us on the slide uh, includes the adaptive reuse of that existing building into state-of-the-art office. Two new residential buildings you'll see to the left and right of that um, with the cursor, there it is, uh, which are going to compri be comprised of age-restricted housing, including affordable housing. Across the street from there, across north, is 16 townhomes age-restricted. There's supportive retail, of about 13,000 square foot on the street. And then there's another residential building at the intersection of North and Clark uh, with 34 market rate units and six. So that's the West Zone when we refer to that in this presentation. Uh, going over to the North Zone, there is a portion of the North Municipal Lot uh, parking lot, not the entire lot, and we'll get to that in a second, but only a 0.22 acre portion of that lot, which will be implicated in the development, which will include a residential building of about 35 loft style apartments and six affordable units, some of supportive retail and a public parking garage. We may refer to it during this presentation as the North Garage of uh, 300 public parking spaces. And then on the next slide, the South Zone is comprised again, a portion of the municipal's parking lot uh, to the South, overall about two acres. Uh, which will be proposed to have two mass timber office buildings, class A office buildings, totaling about 210,000 square feet with some supported, supportive re, uh, retail along South Avenue and the Boulevard Extension. Uh, if you, Jim, with your cursor, if you can track the Boulevard Extension is right in between those two buildings, uh, which will be, uh, it's intended to be a public uh, thoroughfare with retail lining that uh, through the middle of those buildings. In addition, there's another parking garage with 200 spaces being proposed. And again, we'll refer to that likely uh, as the South Garage throughout this presentation. So those are the three zones of development here. And overall, uh, a lot of what we're gonna focus on tonight is the public improvements because a lot of the financing uh, that we're gonna be talking about is only possible, these public improvements are only possible um, through the financing that we're talking about here. So on the top, you have a, an image of the overall development. And on the bottom, you have two images. On the left, shaded in red, uh, that's where we're talking about the private development. And again, on the left side, where that west zone is, all of that red on the left side is all owned by Hudson's Bay Company right now. That's the old Lord and Taylor buildings and all their properties around there where the property is developed. And on the right-hand side, uh, those three red indicators, that is where uh, the North Zone and the South Zone uh, is proposed for the private development. The right slide on the bottom in blue, and you'll notice along both North Avenue, South Avenue, and, and down, you'll see there are, those roads are also shaded blue because we're, there's a lot of public improvements being proposed. All of that area, all that blue, that's, that's the remaining property of both the North and South lot that's not being conveyed. Uh, or proposed to be conveyed as part of this redevelopment that's staying with the town and going to be improved with the public improvements we're about to talk about. So you can see the distinction between the two. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Here's the list of what's being proposed uh, that comprise right now of over 40, $54 million of planned public improvements against, again, leveraged out of the overall uh, investment uh, being proposed here and the financing structure uh, that we're going to go talk about. So on the North Avenue, we have the town square and we have some images we'll show in a second. Uh, that's right up north of the train station, town green, right south of the train station. We have the two parking garages, the North garage and the South garage. Uh, and with those garages, we're talking about including a new smart technology townwide parking system uh, to uh, address those parking. We have traffic and congestion mitigation upgrades at 11 key intersections. Uh, we know there's been a whole other Facebook Live about traffic, so we don't want to uh, uh, reduplicate those efforts, but we have, we have those upgrades. And as the mayor said earlier today on this call, those issues that are being solved already exist today. They're not being created. 
Uh, we have uh, the improvements and enhancements to Quimby Street, uh, which includes not just Quimby Street, but, but the proposed uh, Snickleway, as you uh, may have seen at the preview center and on other calls, uh, other roadways improvements, streetscape improvements, uh, the mobility hub on both the north and south to include all different uh, forms of mobility, bike, pedestrian, rideshare, uh, et cetera, uh, the pedestrian walkway, the tunnel improvements between the north and south side and other safety improvements. Um, Jim, the next slide. So here's, here's generally the location of these improvements. So on the north, these are the public spaces. You have Quimby Street, you have the North Avenue Town Square, you have the South Avenue Town Green, south of the train station, next slide. The mobility hub, again, bo on both sides, including the, the lockers, the bike repair stations and racks, the charging stations, ride share, uh, a renovation of the train station and the underpass. The North Garage, the South Garage, and the new technology town parking system. Hey, Steve, can I just weigh yes. in on that for one, sure. one second? Because I think it's important for people to understand how also that plays into traffic, which is seen, which is a really, you know, source of concern for many. Um, there's two things on this page, particularly that help in terms of traffic mitigation. One is the split between the North and North and South Avenue public parking garages. Um, we know that through our permitting that half of commuter parking, half of commuter parkers are on the North and half are on the South and currently all have to go to the South side to park. By now having it split and, uh, uh, and bisecting the, the parking, it's going to mitigate traffic from people having to travel from the north side of town to the south side of town. The other thing about the smart technology, and I think this is really important, is the number one um, creator of traffic downtown is people circling looking for a parking spot. Mm -hmm. And many of you may have been to places in parking garages where you can see outside, it'll tell you how many spots are available. That's exactly what this is intended to do and it will be town wide and it can operate from an app from your phone. So before you leave the house, you can go directly to where a spot is available. And not only is it more convenient for you, but it's another, another opportunity to mitigate some of that unnecessary circulation in, tra in town looking for traffic, looking for parking. So just want to give people understand what those benefits were. Thank you, Mayor, absolutely. Public safety improvements. So you hear, you see here circled, these are the 11 intersections that are proposed to have upgrades as part of this project uh, and, and really included in sequencing throughout the construction uh, of the project. And this is a great slide to evidence exactly what we mean when we say redevelopment is a comprehensive and a cohesive um, look at the area, the downtown and taking into effect the implications of, of both the new development and ways you can improve and leverage that redevelopment on existing issues in town. If you had traditional infill, infill development piecemeal one lot of the time, these are the sorts of improvements that would be likely impossible to achieve um, leveraging the structure that we're being proposed today versus the vision that the mayor saw years ago in combining the Lord and Taylor reuse with the with the greater downtown uh, next slide and again streetscape improvements over 150,000 square feet of sidewalk improvement upgrades are being proposed including 200 new trees so we have a couple of images here if you haven't seen them just again we're going to be talking about them this is uh this is the on the north side uh this is the north uh plaza and steve can you just yes. pause on this for sure. a minute because I think this this and the South Side um, Green are really critical components of this project. And uh, one of the things that we set out to do was wanted to create more community gathering spots. Um, I think we've seen the overwhelming success of Open Quimby in the summer, and we want to see how we can replicate that in more places around town. And these are these both of these spots will be activated. Um, town squares. Uh, so for many of you, I'm sure have been to Bryant Park. Dan Biederman, who's behind Bryant Park, is the one that's actually working on the programmatic aspects for both of these. And so this type of thing we is not something that would be possible for the town to do on its own um, because it's so um, complex in terms of what it needs to do. It impacts traffic, it impacts parking, it impacts pedestrian safety, uh, so forth. So 
I think when you just take a look at this image, and that's going to be the new maze, you know, cocktails and cochina place where the train station is. Um, it really is um, uh, a, a real, uh, I think, transformative community opportunity. I just wanted to make sure people understood what that visual represented. Right. Including, Mayor, that we're um, proposing to fix um, the huge pedestrian and traffic problem where Elm Street runs into the train station so that, um, you know, it'll be safer, more inviting, easier flows, um, and it'll, um, that curbless environment, uh, you know, in front of the train station means that that space can be activated for a lot of um, different activities. And currently, when you look at that bib, it, you know, it's all asphalt with a, with a small square, you know, green with the tree, but it's, it's all asphalt and parking. Um, and this is just a really, I think, amazing, inviting community space that can serve lots of functions in terms of an enhanced farmer's market and um, you know, yoga on the green and all those types of things. So it's a quite, it has lots of multi-purpose uh, town square. Right. And uh, Mayor, I'll just say one more thing because I, I know that um, some, some people have asked questions about some of these visuals. These are um, uh, just, uh, potential outcomes um, for spaces like this. So this is not finalized. This is one of the things that we're looking for the public to provide us feedback on. So, you know, as you look at this and think about er things that you might want to see, you know, improved or changed, um, you know, please, you know, provide your inputs. Um, this is just to give you an idea of what could be possible in, um, in the place of just a lot of parking spots, which is what we have today. Yes, so conceptual, a lot of these are conceptual, but to give you yeah. the sense, thanks for bringing that up. All right, thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Councilwoman. Uh, so that was the town plaza, uh, the town plaza on the north side. This also on the north side. This is a reimagining of the uh, underpass tunnel. Then we have on the next slide uh, a conceptual image of Quimby Street reimagined during uh, a festival, which can be activated in many different ways and programmed in many different ways, as the mayor pointed out. And Steve, I just want to make something up too. I, the, the plan for Quimby, which isn't really reflected here, this is like when it could be closed. The plan is to memorialize the one-way street um, that you see during open Quimby with parking, but it by only having one way, it enables you to create an expansion of the sidewalks on both sides. It maintains the parking, but it also is contemplating electric bollards that could come easily come up and down. So the street could easily be closed off um, nights, weekends, how, however we want in a way that doesn't require our police to move concrete barricades back and forth. So that's, uh, so this again is more conceptual, but just to give you the sense. Yep. And then this is a, another part of the Quimby's way. This is that Snickle way um, conceived right now. So with, with the overview of what is, what we're going to be talking about, that's not to, um, a little what could happen in the future that's not even right now planned. And that's because what you're going to hear is a lot of uh, the financing tonight is based on a very conservative uh, use of, of funds generated by pilot revenues, um, limited right now to 80%. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, but down the line, this is potentially going to enable, uh, like many towns have throughout New Jersey, things like a new firehouse like support for school district uh, capital improvements as they would come up and overall long-term tax stabilization. We're gonna talk a little bit more in detail about that as we go on. And Steve, not to interrupt one yes. more time, but I, I just went on the school piece that you mentioned. I, yes. We are in active conversations with the school board. Uh, the first group we met with was the day after Streetworks presented their proposal was with the school board um, and the superintendent to, and to discuss how we can work together over the long-term to support their needs and so forth. So it's a very collaborative uh, process and we're very happy that, you know, we're gonna work together to help identify needs and, 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 and how they, this project could potentially benefit them as well. Yeah. So we're gonna turn now to uh, just a basic overview of pilots. There's a pilot proposed on this project. We've uh, talked about them before if you've been involved in the Westfield project, but they stand for payment in lieu of taxes. Okay, these do not mean that the developer, uh, the redeveloper in this case, is not going to be making payments to the town. Uh, to the contrary, 
uh, the redeveloper is going to be making payments to the town and the town is going to be retaining payments in greater uh, amounts than would have otherwise a had the project not gone forward and we'll talk about that possibility and also be even if the project was completed and paid ad valorem taxes uh, this is a program that has been in effect in one form or another since 1961 so we're talking uh, over 60 years in new jersey that uh, the state has empowered municipalities to form these public private partnerships uh, with with redevelopers and execute agreements with them for pilots. The current iteration uh, is under a law from 92 known as the long-term tax exemption law. It's widely used um, and is growing in use because of the age of, of certain infrastructure in a lot of suburban areas um, like Westfield. It's a powerful tool that is used as an incentive to attract private investment in an area in a manner established by the municipality in a redevelopment plan that would otherwise not be financially viable. So I know that sounds like what I'm saying is absent a pilot, a developer wouldn't be able to come into Westfield and develop on that piece of property, which is not what I'm saying. Um, I think we can all imagine that there could be piecemeal development uh, in Westfield. What we're saying is, however, that a redevelopment plan is envisioned here that takes into effect the cohesive and comprehensive goals and objectives that have been set out by the mayor and council here uh, in, a, in, a, in a design with a quality uh, and a purpose as set forth in the redevelopment plan usually cannot be attained without the assistance of financial tools such as a pilot. On top of that, the pilot payments are usually, as we're talking about here today, able to be leveraged and take advantage of them to be able to obtain sometimes capital improvements and projects uh, that the town simply can't afford on its own um, and have long wanted. So you can, we can go to the next slide. So the process uh, to undertake this uh, is typically what we're doing now and what has been going on uh, after the adoption of a redevelopment plan, uh, which is the professionals from the development side and the professionals from the town side evaluate the costs and assumptions on, of, of the project. And in doing so, we're looking at things on the cost side, such as the property acquisition cost, remediation costs, site improvements, construction costs, the cost of financing, which has gone up, as, as most of you know this year, tremendously, uh, what the design costs are, and what the operating costs are going to be. On the other side of the ledger, we look at the projected revenue. We want to make sure that the revenues being projected, A, are enough to sustain the project, uh, but B, are accurate to reflect uh, what the developer's return on that investment is going to be. Um, once we've developed what the, those assumptions are, we look at how they're going to be funded and by what source. And we want to make sure that the redeveloper's equity is appropriate, how that, that, that equity contribution uh, is, is, is being made, who the partners are, we vet them. We look at the terms of any financing that's going to be involved in, in the redevelopment. And when we put all that together, we develop a model that you're going to hear from Bob Powell in just a little bit to determine, okay, does this project warrant the use of a long-term tax exemption and a pilot? Uh, and if so, at what terms is such a pilot appropriate? Um, so you're going to hear those numbers soon. There are other factors that go into that, that calculus. Um, how is the municipal budget going to be affected um, by, by, by the use, the proposed uses? Uh, what is the impact on the school district? We know that's a big, big consideration for many of you. And we're going to talk about it. Um, there's municipal property that's, that's going to be sold here. What is the impact of that sale? Um, and once that analysis is done, ultimately, the redeveloper will submit an application to the mayor, uh, and it will go to the council by, for consideration and approved by ordinance. And what is approved will be reduced to a financial agreement, which brings us to our next slide, which contains all of the terms uh, covering the exemption. Now here I outline what the standard terms are. We don't have a financial agreement right now. None, none, none has been uh, finalized or proposed yet, but typically you're seeing these financial agreements at 30 years in length. The ASC or annual service charge is what gets paid in lieu of the taxes. And that can be calculated in a few different ways, but typically it is based on a percentage of the annual gross revenue. And I wanna underscore that it is the gross revenue. 
So sometimes you, if, if you Google around and find pilots, you'll find some resources that confuse what the definition of gross revenue is and start discussing things like, you know, what deductions uh, the, the developer is going to take, what they're counting as their gross revenue, uh, what, it, what the expenses are to reduce that. None of that matters for what we're talking about here. This is a top line gross, gross revenue. Every cent of revenue is counted. And then you take a percentage of that, and that is your annual service charge. Under the statute, unless, for, other than specific projects, it cannot be less than 10% of the gross revenue. And then starting in year 16, there's a, a phased increase so that it gets phased up to what ad valorem taxes um, will be. Now, this is what we're, what we're talking about here in the pilot. We're talking about the improvements on the land. So you, if you're a taxpayer in town, you've been a taxpayer, you understand that assessment is based on both the land value assessment and the value of the improvements. The land taxes, although in some cases, and including here, could have been exempt as well. The land taxes here are not going to be exempt and payment for land taxes are gonna to continue to be paid and split between the municipality, county, and school district. Notably, for the two lots of municipal uh, portions of the lots that are going to be conveyed, those lots have never been taxed because they're municipally owned and now we'll have a land tax assessment to them, adding to the revenue uh, by the county and the school district for those land. The pilot payment, 95% of it is kept by the town, 5% is transferred to the county, payments are made quarterly, and an important consideration, I know there were some questions um, that, we, that we received and people have, hey, why, why a sale of the property? Why not a long-term lease? Well, there's many reasons for that. Principally here is this, is this last bullet point. When you have a sale of property, you are able to secure the pilot payments by a municipal lien, as well as the contractual terms of the financial agreement. Um, there are other reasons for that, but principally we are secured, the pilot payments are secure like a tax through a municipal lien. Okay, um, a couple of, if we can just go back to the last slide, it's not on here, but I think a couple of other things worth noting about the financial agreement uh, that, that is important here is by agreeing to have a pilot, a redeveloper is agreeing to comply both with the long-term tax exemption law and the terms of the financial agreement, which provide a profit limitation. And sometimes you will have um, the thought that, well, these are, you know, what, what happens if the redeveloper hits a grand slam here, not just a home run, but it's a grand slam and, and they didn't need the pilot after all. Well, first of all, to that, I say, that's great because their success is our success. The more revenue they generate, the more revenue uh, gets sent to the town. Uh, but on top of that, there is, there is this profit limitation. And every year, the redeveloper is required to submit an annual audit by an independent um, CPA that demonstrates two things. One, it has to calculate their profits to ensure that it hasn't exceeded the statutory limit on the, on the net profit gap. And two, it substantiates what their revenue was because those quarterly payments that are made have to add up to the penny to what their percentage truly is. So if there is a shortfall, uh, another payment will be made. So annual audits uh, and the net profit limitation are two key components of the financial agreement that provide protection uh, to the town. Thanks, Jim. So because here in this redevelopment project, what we're talking about financing, a lot of it does um, deal with the sale of uh, roughly 2.3 acres of land, and you saw on the earlier slide what that portion was of the greater lots on the north and south side. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the sale of those properties. The redevelopment law in New Jersey encourages municipalities to form those partnerships to meet the redevelopment plans. And one of those tools that is used very often is the town's ability to buy, sell, or lease its property in connection with the redevelopment plan without public bidding and at prices and such terms as it deems reasonable. You, it is not uncommon to find that re, a redevelopment plan or a redevelopment agreement that implicates the conveyance of such property at no consideration or nominal consideration like a dollar because the public benefits that are implicated by the greater redevelopment 
are the consideration for the conveyance of property. It's necessary to carry out the intent of that plan in a comprehensive and connected manner. Now, having said that, that's not what's being proposed here. What's being proposed here is a sale of those properties uh, at roughly $10.1 million. And that's a value that is going to be prior to the redevelopment agreement being uh, executed, uh, independently verified by an independent appraiser as to its fair market value. Uh, so we wanted to just touch that and make, make sure we, we addressed that. Um, and with that, I think, uh, oh, yeah, we had this slide as well. There's the, in shaded in red are the portions of property that we're talking about being conveyed. With that, I think it is uh, time to hand the baton off to, to Bob. All right, thank you, Steve. Let me uh, continue the discussion uh, about a pilot that Steve so uh, eloquently laid out for us by giving you a little more detail about the process that, that we have gone through and that most towns go through in evaluating two questions about the redevelopment finance. One is, is a pilot necessary to make the project financially feasible, given all of the components that the project is going to include? Um, that is to say, could it be financially successful if it were subject to full taxes? That's, that's the first step that needs to be taken in this case. And the second step then is if we determine that the project is likely not financially feasible, subject to full taxes, we then have a second question to address, which is, What's the structure of the pilot agreement uh, going to be to the, to serve the best interest of the town and still preserve the financial feasibility of the project to the developer? As Steve pointed out a moment ago, the statute provides a town with a range of pilot rates that can be levied under the formula uh, as a percentage of annual gross revenues, and we're going we're to get to that in just a moment. But let me first tell you the role that our team played with the other professionals on this call, uh, starting about 15 or 18 months ago, I think it was, in digging into the finances of, of this redevelopment project. Uh, our job was to line up a very detailed and prepare a very detailed financial worksheet that is very similar to the financial analysis that any investor is going to do uh, for a similar project. It's intended to determine whether the numbers that go into a redevelopment project, the cost, the revenues, the financing, can justify in terms of a profit and a return on investment, can justify that level of private equity investment. Um, it's a calculation that is done in almost every investment, whether it's real estate or something else in the capital markets today. Uh, developers have a very sophisticated way of doing that. Uh, in my development experience, I did a lot of that for my own purposes. Public agencies often aren't as experienced in doing that kind of analysis. And so when the negotiations for a financial agreement arise, it's important for the public officials to have a complete understanding of, of the financial metrics of the project and the, the financial feasibility um, that we're talking about in terms of a result. So here's what we did. We, with the collaboration of the developer, we examined, as you see here, um, in some detail, all the projected development costs. And just as a a footnote to that, when I talk about all the development costs, as Steve outlined to you a moment ago, this project has a dozen different components, different kinds of office space, different kinds of residential space, some retail space. All of the components of those private investments carry with them in the private sector their own special costs uh, to, to build them. They also carry with them certain uh, not just construction costs, but soft costs, the cost of design, architect, engineering, fees, uh, other consultants, environmental consultants. Um, those costs are, are put together by us based on a wealth of data that we have collected 
working in the private sector and with scores of developers doing just these kinds of projects. We have the benefit of being inside the room with dozens and dozens of other private developments that we're also analyzing and watching them get built and priced. So we have a, a very good, I think, understanding of what costs are and how they change from year to year. Um, and we can therefore examine the developer's proposed costs and make a determination about whether we think they're credible. And we have done that in great detail in this case. Right. And Bob, I, I just want to um, jump in for a second and emphasize what you're um, sharing with everyone tonight, because um, it's um, been an incredibly invaluable process to um, watch the negotiations and see from the town side of the table all of the experience and um, you know, knowledge of the market and you know, other structuring tools that have been used in other deals, help you know, along the way to identify you know, all the risks that are there and what different ways that we can mitigate them, um, you know, uh, try, you know, just helping, you know, the town to avoid, um, you know, any situations that could potentially in the future be pitfalls for us. Um, and so, you know, that's, um, you know, I, I just, the, the, ana the analytical tools that we have, you know, have, um, you know, are one thing, but it's, you know, really the wealth of knowledge and experience um, that all of you are bringing to the table to you know help us evaluate the um, way forward. Thank you. So in addition to diving deeply into the development costs of this project, we also did a careful examination of income and expenses. That's the other part of the financial model that will drive profitability or not. So this is all rental income that's being talked about here. All of these improvements that we're talking about will be rental properties. Uh, they have different characteristics, offices, retail stores, age-restricted housing, affordable housing, townhouses. Um, the good news is that the, the information about rental income in sub-markets um, is relatively available and readily available. Uh, there's a lot of transparency now because of uh, the databases that are being assembled in the real estate business. So we have in the model that we have, we've done numerous models and the most recent set of models have indicated what our view is of the development costs, the rental income, the operating costs of, of running these operations. That really is an important factor too, because developers, um, sometimes will not be fully transparent about what their development costs are, and they'll just give a town a number. We have a database that have, will break it down between all the various operating costs across several comparable projects in terms of size and quality. Another key factor in the feasibility of the project is where is their money coming from? What's the source of funds? It's typically only two sources of funds until you get into some financial incentives from public agencies. The first source of funds is borrowed money. Most of us have had experience buying real estate, whether it's a home or a business, you go to a bank and you get a long-term or short-term loan to pay for some of the cost. The other source of funds is equity, capital that the owners have to put in. The financing costs for projects like this, and by the way, financing is usually somewhere between 60 and 75% of the total cost. In the last few years, because of the credit market's turmoil and inflation, um, the ability to borrow for projects like this at a rate of much more than 60 or 65% of cost has been limited. There have been times in the past when a developer could borrow 75 or 80% of project cost, but increasingly now the capital markets are requiring more and more equity to go in as a percentage of cost. We've analyzed that and made that part of our analysis. And we've also analyzed the price of those sources. So what's the price of a loan? I think all of us have experienced in our own ways that interest rates have gone up sharply in 2022 on all forms of debt, uh, including real estate debt, mortgage debt, um, 
mortgages uh, a year ago, you could buy a new home with a 3% 30-year mortgage. And today, the interest rate is at least double that. That same phenomenon has occurred in the commercial mortgage business. We have, in the model, focused on what we think the right set of numbers are, given the time frame and the schedule for this project. Um, and we've similarly looked at the projected income uh, of the rental properties. Uh, and the way we get a, a comfort level on the projected income that we've gotten from the developer is look carefully at what are called comparable projects in this area comparable office buildings, comparable townhouses, comparable first-class apartments. What are the developers actually getting in net operating rent and net, net rent? We plug all of that into um, a multi-sheet set of worksheets to calculate at the end of the day, one major result. What is the projected return on investment that this project that we've just modeled is likely to generate for the developer if the developer makes the equity investment that we've calculated he's likely to have to make. The, the answer to that question is really going to determine whether the project is financially feasible. And the, the short answer to what is the right equity return is that for this type of real estate, in our considerable experience, uh, the internal the, the rate of return on equity investment for something like this needs to be around 10 or 11 percent at minimum in order to be competitive. Investors have choices about where they can put their investments. And there are still, even in this turbulent time, there are many, many opportunities to invest in rental real estate that can generate reasonably credible return projections at 10 percent or up to 15 percent. So having done all of that homework, and it was in collaboration with a developer because we dug deeply, but we often had differences of opinion about what we thought the correct assumptions ought to be. Um, we created a model that gave us a couple of conclusions. If we can flip to the next screen. Before I get to that, I wanted to make one other point. In this particular project, the development agreement with the town that's being put together, um, as, as the mayor and Linda has, have indicated, is going to include a number of not just private improvements that the developer is going to make, but a number of investments in features of the project that serve a clear public purpose. Public purpose. The first of these is, is low and moderate income housing that will be part of the project. Uh, low and moderate income housing is rental in, rental property that is subsidized basically by the developer to make the units affordable for what are called low income households and moderate income households. Um, the other feature of this project package that the developer is going to be funding are a series of public improvements on public property uh, that the town has ask that they that be included in the development budget for the developer uh, that amount to approximately $8 million of private investment, um, as well as another $3 million of improvements on the developer's property that typically would not have to be made in a normal site plan set of conditions. These are improvements that will enhance the experience of coming and going on the properties that they're being privately developed but that will increase the cost of developing those properties uh, by an additional $3 million. So- and Bob, and Bob, just to be clear, that 11 million is incremental to the over $50 million that um, Steve Lenick already outlined. Correct, yes. that's exactly right. Yeah, and all of those public improvements, um, it's also important to note, are will all be done to the town's um, specification. That's part of the beauty of the redevelopment agreement that um, the town has, you know, complete control over, um, you know, what the developer will build on his own property and what the public improvements will look like. Correct. So let's go to the next slide. Let me summarize what we concluded as a result of um, 
over a year of negotiation and analysis and fact finding about the the financial model of the project. Number one, I've concluded that at full taxes, if the project were subject to full taxes, the project will be profitable. It, it'll it'll generate a return on investment in in the mid single digits. Uh, depending on where we are in the negotiations about public improvements on their property and the other public improvements, it's it's going to range between seven and eight percent return on investment. That is not an adequate result in today's capital markets, keeping in mind that this entire project, West Zone, North Zone, South Zone combined, that you've just seen a preview of, is likely to require an equity investment in addition to the debt of approximately $150 million. That kind of investment is not feasible or practical um, in the context of a, of a return that's as low as we found it to be if the project is subject to full real estate taxes. We then turn to the question of um, what type of pilot agreement can be negotiated to the best advantage of the town, um, which means the most revenue under the pilot agreement, and still maintain the financial viability of the project. Um, we're going to describe, I'm going to describe here what the rates are that, that are tentatively included in the, uh, negotiate, the negotiated agreement and well, the financial agreement. And based on those projected pilot payment rates, we're seeing a return on equity in just above 10%, um, very low double digit. Um, that is satisfactory. I can tell you as a professional looking at a wide variety of similar investments, that's considered satisfactory, but at the low end of the kind of returns that are being achieved by similar projects. We think it's sufficient to justify the equity, um, but it's also important to underscore that in my opinion, this result confirms to the governing body that's working with us that this investment return is not excessive. It is not excessive in the context of the costs, the lease up risks that this developer is gonna face and the uncertainty that we're still dealing with in the US economy because of inflation and the potential for a recession over the next three to five years. Um, those are all real risks. Nothing's been built yet. Nothing's been readied, and so, all we're dealing with here and really all the developers been dealing with are projections. We think our projections are reasonable and, and conservative from the town's point of view, and that the 10% roughly return on investment is, is a credible return, but not excessive. Assuming that the agreement lands on the rates that we are talking about here, which we'll show you again in a moment, the projected pilot payments represent approximately 70% of full taxes, theoretically full taxes, in the first five years of the agreement. You'll see later, that, by the way, that these pilot payment rates are going to start at one level, and then they gradually go up as a percentage of annual gross revenues over the 30 years. So the percentage of annual gross revenues grows over the, over the term just by the very nature of the agreement. So the first five years, we estimate that the pilot will generate will, will, will be the equivalent of about 70% of full taxes. In years six through 15, because the rates are gonna go up, the pilot will represent about 75% of full taxes. And in the last 15 years of the agreement, because the pilot rates go up again in that period of time, the pilot rate will be roughly 81% of full taxes. And as Steve may have mentioned, at the end of the 30-year term of a financial agreement, what happens? The project reverts to full taxes. It goes back to paying full real estate taxes, whatever they may be 30 years from now. So let's flip to the next. Here, here is where we are at this point in the negotiations about pilot rates. Um, years one through five of the agreement, the 
pilot payment would be 13% of annual gross revenues. And Steve defined that term a minute ago, I think very, very well. Then, and then starting in year six, the payments go to 14% of annual gross revenues, then 15% uh, from years 16 through 30. Um, that's the schedule that we've proposed and that we think makes the most sense from the town's point of view and still maintains the financial feasibility of the project from the developer and permits the developer to include in the project those elements that I talked about earlier that are public purpose investments that are important to the town. Steve mentioned too that in the statute, there are, there are statutory minimum payments that have to be made no matter what the rates are in the middle column here. And so that third column indicates that starting in year 16 of the agreement, whatever the pilot revenues are in that year, they have to be at least 20% of what full taxes would be in that period of time each year. That percentage of full taxes that's the minimum starts to rise as you see uh, on, a, on a yearly basis to 40% of full taxes, 60%, and then by year 30, whatever the pilot rates are, they need to be paying at least 80% of full taxes as the minimum. Bob, if we can, I'm sorry to interrupt, but on the no, last go ahead. slide, it may be also helpful to point out that where we have NA for years one to 15, there is still a minimum payment that is required. Uh, once the project is, or a component of that project is substantially complete, correct, which is the taxes paid on that property in the last calendar year before the pilot kicks in. Right. So there'll, there'll never be a point in time where the property is paying less taxes than it would be in the year prior to the pilot kicking in. Right. And right now the, um, there are, no, there are no taxes being paid, obviously, on the public property, but on the Lord and Taylor site, I think that the taxes are being paid now are roughly 525000 537000 a year. So let's, in this slide, let's take a look at what our projected pilot revenues are, um, um, both from the pilot revenues and, as Steve pointed out, the land tax revenues. Uh, I would. I think the best way to look at this is just to go all the way over to the right-hand column, total revenue, just to get a bigger picture. So in year 2027, which is really at the commencement of completion of a multi-phase project, this is when several of the components in the West Zone have been put into, into operation and are stabilized. Th that first year, we expect $494,000 of total revenue to the town. By five years later, as many, many more of the improvements have been completed and occupied and paying pilot payments, that total pilot revenue, that total revenue will be a little over $5 million that year. Five years later, that's gonna to jump to a little over 6 million. And as you see, it's gonna to continue to go up until the last year, 2056, when we expect it to be almost $11 million in that year. The cumulative, as you see, for that 30-year period is $213 million for the total revenue stream during that period. Bob, I'll, I'll also note here, um, because it, this we didn't want to confuse or um, clog up the table by showing every single year of 30 years. Um, so... Um, if you try to add up <laughs> these columns, they're not. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly total. right. Thank you, Linda. Right, so just um, no, don't don't no worry. It it wasn't intended to add up. It was just to give you an idea of in each year what right. the um, total revenue is expected to be as we go through the whole thirty year period, and then mm -hmm. the bottom um, numbers reflect the you know the aggregation of those amounts over the thirty years. Yep. And so I think this chart does one other thing, right? It, it it gives you a perspective of the revenue from the west side versus north south. And so, you know, I think we we all obviously can say that the west zone residential is you know going to be 
pretty successful given what the product is and what the demand for it is. But if people are asking, well, I don't know, post COVID, what about the office? You know, if the office is only 60% full, what does that mean? I mean, this gives you a good sense of where the revenue is coming from. It gives you a good sense of what would happen if some of the, of the project didn't come online exactly how everyone planned. And it goes to show you still just how much excess revenue there is that's available under a variety of scenarios that people may be thinking about. Right. So let's go to the next um, slide. And here, I think I'm going to pass the mic over to Matt to talk about how we transition from pilot revenues to um, the financing of public improvements. Right. Uh, thanks, Bob. So as we see here, again, just as a, a brief and quick reminder, we have $54.2 million approximately of planned public improvements on town-owned land. Um, we've seen them before, we've seen the renderings. The question really is, how do we get the project to pay for these public improvements? We know these projects are exciting, and in most cases they're needed, but we also know that we don't wanna pay for them. So we are looking to the project to pay for them. And there's a couple sources of um, revenue that we look to, to fund the public improvements. And again, this is public improvements only. As Bob sort of touched on, all of the private development is funded 100% with private equity, private lending, et cetera. This is only associated with that list of public improvements that the town will ultimately own, as Councilman Habgood said, design and then um, own. So a couple tranches, right? The first one is, the $16.5 million to fund the North parking garage that Steve referenced earlier on the corner of North Avenue and Central will be funded through a redevelopment area bond issue. Bond issue number one, think of it as. The parking deck on the south side, uh, parking uh, by the south side train station, 200 spaces. That's going to cost approximately $13 million and it, again be, be funded with a um, redevelopment area bond issue. Think of that as bond issue number two. That leaves about $24.5 million, give or take, to fund, the, to fund the balance of public improvements. $8 million comes from a cash contribution, which is made pretty much up front uh, by Streetworks, as Bob had mentioned earlier. And the balance- and, 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 and Matt, I'm sorry, just a question had come in saying what comprises that $8 million in public improvements? So I think just uh, it really is a, a cash contribution to offset uh, the public improvement costs. Is that correct? It, it is, right? I, I suspect that that money will um, be used on the earlier side, right? So you could think of it as funding some of the improvements that got done first, and they're some of the you know meaningful and big ones. Um, and and just, a, just a pause on that, because I think that's, an, I don't know if you get to it later, but I think that's an important point to realize is that we also some of those exciting public improvements like the greens and stuff we didn't want to have to wait until the whole project had completed before we could begin so we are also looking for opportunities to get significant cash contributions up front that will enable us to accelerate some of the public improvements so the public could enjoy them sooner rather than later so that would be an example of that is that correct that's right it's also in my view it's a it's one of our risk mitigating factors too right because we don't want to be issuing bonds ahead of project development. So the fact that the $8 million is coming in early and is being spent on the earlier side allows us to sit back and ensure that the balance of the development unfolds the way it's supposed to, because as we'll get to in a minute, if it doesn't unfold in that way for some reason, we get to sort of hit the brakes a little bit, right, on what we have to do from a, um, from a bond issue perspective. It also, um, Mayor, it goes to another question we often get, with, which is, well, this project kicks off a lot of excess revenue. Why are we issuing the bonds instead of just paying for those projects? And while, as we go through it, you'll see this project does kick off a significant amount of, of additional revenue to the town, um, it ramps up and it's over time, right? So the idea here is to try and deliver all of these improvements because the town residents and businesses, quite frankly, shouldn't have to wait for these improvements, right? These should be done up front and they should be delivered as part of the overall experience and not paid for over a series of years, even a decade or longer, um, if we did pay as you go. So 
Um, another reason why the redevelopment area bonds make a lot of sense in this circumstance. So again, of the 24 and a half million that's left, we get an $8 million cash contribution that comes in up front. That serves a variety of purposes, including um, better securing the town. And then that leaves a balance of 16 and a half million, which will be a mix of um, a public improvement RAB uh, bond issue and town reinvestment of a portion of the land sale proceeds. And that's bundled together um, at this point intentionally because we want the town to have the flexibility to determine financially what makes the most sense there. So this is critically important, right? You heard me talk a minute ago about the three different bond issues. We're not issuing all of those bonds at one time. The main reason we're not doing that is to protect and provide security for the town. We're only going to issue each series of bonds once Streetworks has achieved certain construction milestones throughout the project. So just by way of example, the North Garage bonds, sort of bond issue number one, um, they're the first ones to, to be issued. That's important because the town needs and has insisted on the North parking deck being completed before Streetworks completes construction or really commences construction of any office space on the south side. At the same time, the town is not going to issue our North parking garage bonds until we know Streetworks is far enough along in the West Zone to know that the project revenue from the West Zone will be coming online in sufficient amounts and on time to pay for those bonds. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that Streetworks can continue to deliver the overall project on time and on schedule, including all of the public improvements. So there's a balancing act there. So to respond to that, we've developed a staging concept where the town does not have to issue each series of bonds until certain uh, project conditions precedent have occurred throughout the site. So if the office, for example, is delayed for any reason, and just by way of example, then so too is the second series of bonds that are only issued if and when the office development um, commences and, and hits certain trigger points. And and that, just to reiterate too, that includes a pre-leasing and because uh, they're not commencing construction until at least 50% of those buildings are pre-leased. And I know that's been a concern among some people. Right, and that's quite frankly common, right? That's, that's one of those things that's sort of a little bit self-policing because generally the developer is not gonna get the construction loan to build the office space unless they've got pre-leasing at a, at a significant level because they, they wanna get repaid too, right? So they need to know that the project's gonna be uh, successful and in the office world, that's sort of the pre-leasing becomes critical. Um, so what this staging really does is ensures that we don't get ahead of project revenues and over issue bonds relative to street works, um, build out and completion of the, of the redevelopment project. So Emma, I think that actually is a um, nice answer to a question that was being asked at the same time about, um, you know, what if the improvements end up exceeding the cost projections and who covers the excess? Um, so maybe we, maybe we should talk about that a little bit more. Uh, sure. So that is a, a great question. Um, we were concerned about that as well. The entire team was. So yeah. we developed essentially this um, pilot sufficiency test. And so what we're going to do is be consistent. We're going to consistently measure 80% of the projected pilot, not 100% the numbers that you just saw in the chart, but 80% of the pre projected pilot against the debt service on bonds already issued and the overall cost of the project. Right, we are, as you can see on this slide here, we are the assumption is that each series of bonds will be issued for 25 years. They'll be issued at level debt service, which is an important security and safety provision for the town. Um, and we're projecting at a 4% interest rate. You've heard a couple times we're being conservative, we're being conservative. That 4% interest rate, which is based on the AAA credit rating of the town, is significantly. Um, uh, conservative. The town did a bond issue a few months ago at 2.20% interest, just sort of for order of magnitude. 
Now, certainly rates are up a little bit, but long-term rates aren't up nearly as much as, as short-term rates are. So those rates are project are, um, are conservative um, to say the least. But getting back to the point of the um, uh, protecting against if there's a shortfall, et cetera, if that interest rate were to be higher in actuality, right? We, we, we've got a debt service cap essentially. So we're only going to, we're gonna measure debt service at the actual interest rate against the 80% of the pilots. And if there isn't sufficient revenue, then we're not doing all of the projects, right? We are going to modify that list because we're not, there's not gonna be a point in time where we're ever issuing more uh, in bonds than the project can support. So we've got a, a safety mechanism in place and the 80% is important for two reasons. One, um, it's, an, it's an additional risk mitigation factor. Um, if the project is built on time, on budget, but rental projections are lower or occupancy is lower, then we've, ac we've accounted for that um, uh, by, by severing off 20%. And or the project could be delivered on time, on budget, and exactly on projection. And we want to make sure there's at least 20% of that pilot that is available at all times for general town use, right? Other than for as project revenue to pay for debt service on these uh, public improvements. Right, exactly. So I think um, in brief, the, the answer is that um, there isn't a way for these um, things to end up costing more than we have sufficient revenue to cover, because as we walk through the process, we're going to understand what the costs are, um, you know, against the revenue and make decisions, um, you know, as we move forward, it won't all be made up front. Correct. Yes. Matt, I think, I, I think another thing to add is the structure itself which proposes that the construction be facilitated through the use of individual guaranteed maximum price contracts um, for each component with that test being done on a periodic basis before entering each of those guaranteed maximum price contracts um, as another layer of that security. That's right, Steve. And, and that also is important to questions that people may be thinking about well, what happens if, or how do we protect from something going in over budget, right? How do we protect from cost overruns? How do we make sure that the $16.5 million parking deck doesn't turn into a $20 million parking deck? And the GMP, the guaranteed maximum price for all of these um, public improvement components is the way to sort of mitigate against that risk and ensure that again, um, you know, we've basically got a cash flow that we're comfortable with and we are you're sort of reverse securitizing what you can pay for based on interest rate and budget at the time so that that cash flow number never never uh, exceeds the cap that we're comfortable with. Yeah. So when we look to those three bond issues, uh, again, 16 and a half million for the North Parking Garage, 25 years, level debt service at a 4% interest rate, that's about $1.36 million a year in average annual debt service. South Parking Garage at 13 million, about $870,000 a year. And for purposes of um, sort of setting a, a max number, we assume for this slide, a $12 million public improvement bond issue, which leads to about $770,000 of debt service. So all in, you're looking at across the three bond issues, um, $3 million in aggregate average annual debt service over a 25 year period. So how do we secure repayment of these uh, redevelopment area bonds? As I mentioned earlier, we, we want to look to the project revenues. We don't want to pay for it. So we want the project to. Um, <clears throat> when you saw the chart earlier that Bob had um, gone through regarding project revenues in a five-year increment, um, an important year in the project is 2030. I think Bob had 2027, maybe 2032. But 2030 is really project stabilization. That's when everything is built everything is occupied and everything is paying um, its, its uh, projected revenues. And at project stabilization, you're looking at $4.6 million in project revenue to the town. That is net of that county 5% you heard Steve talk about earlier. That's net of land taxes that go to the Board of Ed and other taxing districts. That is truly the revenue to the town only. <clears throat> 
And as you saw from the chart, that escalates up to nearly $11 million in, um, in year 30. So that averages out to about $7.13 million in average annual projected revenues and a total of $213 million, against which we're talking about $73 million roughly of um, debt service, leading to $140 million to the town over 30 years for general municipal use. Now, again, as we've said before, that certainly ramps up, right? It's not um, all that money's not coming in on day one, but that is importantly over four and a half million dollars a year um, on average to against a municipal tax levy, as the mayor mentioned earlier. Um, it's it, that's about fifteen percent on an average basis of what the municipal municipal taxes raise today, what we all pay today, right, to fund the town. And, and Matt and Bob, Stephen, put that in context for folks. 15% infusion into the into a municipal budget is like that's fairly atypical on the projects you work on i i imagine is that correct absolutely i mean it's it's uh, it's extraordinarily large number um and and those of your residents who follow the municipal budget i'm sure are aware of the strains that it, it's under every year with operating costs going up 2 3% um this will be um, a significant increase in cash flow um, above and beyond the debt service that Matt's describing on the bonds that will be an extraordinary, an extraordinary source of revenue. Uh, and, for the and so, there, so there's, there's two really big benefits to residents and taxpayers. There's the community, the public benefits that you've outlined that the town would normally never be able to afford within the constraints of our municipal budget, as you just mentioned. And then there's the second $140 million component that you mentioned is our goal and ability to stabilize taxes for the long term. And I think that's uh, the two of, usually if you're lucky enough to get one or the other, but this is right. an opportunity for us to be able to do both. And I think that's what's um, exciting to all of us about what this, what you, what you all have negotiated. Is the next oh good i'm glad this is the next slide because i think that was those were a lot of bullets and numbers on the prior slide but um this really helps to um illustrate the the level debt service the blue line in the graph and then the orange line reflects the expected pilot revenues that are coming in over the course of the redevelopment agreement that's right councilwoman and, and from my perspective this is really important because we are not dependent on growth in the project and in project revenues in order to have sufficient project revenues to pay debt service, right? What you often see in projects are those two lines sort of trailing each other, right? Staying the maybe equidistant apart, but often trailing each other. So as project revenue grows, the debt service is built to grow with it. Um, what this does is from the beginning, from project stabilization, we have you know about one and a half times the amount of revenue we need to pay debt service on the bonds. And even if rents don't go up over a, a five, 10, 15 year period at all, not one dollar, not one percentage, we still have you know 150 percent of the project revenue we need to pay debt service. Now that's not what we want, right? It's not what the developer wants for sure. But it, it, we don't rely on growth of success of the project. I mean, we just rely on not even stabilization. Less than stabilization is enough um, to, to certainly pay back all the debt service and provide additional revenue to the town. But as somebody, I forget who mentioned earlier, you know, we want the project to succeed, right? Because when the project succeeds, we succeed. And this shows, I think, illustrates um, you know, the, the level of that success to the town relative to debt to our debt service expense staying, um, you know, flat level. So, as I mentioned earlier, we are issuing bonds um, at a staged at stage intervals after commencement of construction but certainly ahead of true and complete project completion, 
right? And, and we need to do that. We want to do that. We need to do that in order to make all of the sequencing of the projects on the various sites happen and to deliver all of the improvements to the town, to the residents and the businesses of the town, um, that, you know, in a time frame that they deserve. So how do we ensure that after we issue those bonds, but before that construction that has already commenced is completed and revenues come in, how do we make sure that we're protected against that potential shortfall? Um, in New Jersey, there's the concept of a special assessment. It is traditionally used by municipalities to fund the construction of new sidewalks, um, water and sewer lines in areas that don't have it, new roads, a variety of other what are considered local improvements. And the idea behind those local improvements are that property owners are benefited by the improvement, so they should pay for the cost of the improvement, right? Um, a property, a property's value goes up if it's connected to a drinking water system versus a well. So if we pay for that, that property to be connected to a water system, they should pay for that improvement. And that's paid via a special assessment, essentially a special additional tax on top of real estate taxes that is paid by the benefited property owner. In the redevelopment context, we can do the same thing. So we can um, assess a special assessment on Streetworks property and charge them and have them pay a special assessment in the event of a shortfall in pilot revenue necessary to pay debt service on the bonds. And the reason that assessment mechanism is so important is because a failure by the developer to make a special assessment payment when due is um, akin to failure to pay real estate taxes. It becomes a first lien on that property being assessed. And so in this case, you have equity, you have equity investors, you have a construction lender, and all of their security is for the most part in the land itself, right? A mortgage on the property. Our special assessment, if there's a shortfall of pilot revenue to pay debt service, will trump those uh, liens that the uh, lenders have on the property. And that's what ensures that Streetworks makes the payment to the town so the town can use that money to pay debt service and not have the town have to worry about uh, finding the revenue from any other source. Um, so this is a mechanism that will secure us during that uh, construction period up until pilots are um, are in and flowing. And, and I, I think we should just take a moment to sort of emphasize how important this um, feature of the whole structure of the deal is, because, um, you know, of course, people are concerned about how we might end up in a situation where um, pilot revenues are insufficient to cover the principal and interest payments that are due on a bond that's already issued, because we don't know exactly what happens in the future. Um, this mechanism was very hard fought um, by all of us um, to ensure that we would never end up in a situation where we would fall short of um, you know, revenues to pay on a bond that had already been issued. That's right. That's right. And so just by way of a, a quick example, again, using the North Garage bonds, um, again, Streetworks is going to commence construction on the west side. They're going to be spending significant amounts of money investing into the west side. They're going to be building, right? We then issue our North Garage bonds. Um, if at that point the developer slows down, maybe through no fault of their own, right, supply chain issues, or they develop ahead of schedule, but occupancy takes longer than projected, or really any reason that you can think of, if those pilot payments from the West Zone are not sufficient coming in on time and on schedule and as projected, and debt service is due on the town bonds, then that special assessment um, payment mechanism kicks in, and Streetworks is obligated to make that assessment payment or risk having the town have a lien on the property ahead of Streetworks um, construction and equity lenders. Right, and and Matt Matt knows how um, concerned I was about exactly how this works <laughs> because I've seen in you know other instruments and other transactions that I've worked on over time, you know performance bonds where you know people you know ultimately have the ability to pay can can delay you know many many years before the payments come in. 
um, you know, this um, structure does not work that way. Um, and it does provide us with exactly the kind of mitigant that we need to that risk. Right. And when you think about the amount of money being invested by multiple entities on the streetwork side for their private development, and you think about, let's say, the debt service on the North Garage bonds at 1.3, roughly, whatever it was, million dollars, you know, let's say they're half short, right? We're still $700,000 or so short. Um, that amount of money, relative to the amount that the lenders have provided to Streetworks, secured by the land, to risk having their asset trumped by the town over a couple hundred thousand bucks, the, the lenders the lenders step up and make that payment. So Matt, can I make one other observation that I think has given us comfort with this, this, this instrument? And that is that um, this current year, before any improvements have been made on the West Zone property, um, your tax assessor has placed an assessed value on that site of $24.9 million, unimproved. Once the redevelopment plan is in place, a, just in place and approved, but B, becoming a reality through construction and groundbreakings and activity, um, that $25 million rough value is obviously going to escalate sharply. And the point I'm making is that keeping those numbers in mind in the context of the North Garage bond issue, which is in what amount? 16 and a half. Well, uh, we need 16 and a half million. Right. It's, it's more than that, obviously, with, with um, issuance costs and capitalized interest. I know, but I mean, we're th this is a solid piece of collateral. That's my point. Yeah, I agreed 100%. Okay. So in, in, a, in a little more detail, and I think I went through it with the South, with the, excuse me, West Zone example. Um, if those project revenues aren't sufficient, Streetworks make a special assessment payment equal to the shortfall of debt service due on the North Parking Garage. It's actually a little bit in excess of that. In addition, the town will we ensure that the town gets the existing tax revenue that it's getting today, right? So that the town doesn't feel a hit to the municipal budget and debt service on those bonds is uh, is covered as well. So it covers two, two things there. Similarly, when we issue bonds uh, for the South Parking Deck for the public improvements, assuming we get to that point, um, if a combination of the West Zone and the North South Zone pilot, so basically if all the project revenue aren't sufficient, then again, there'd be a special assessment payment due on the South um, properties equal to debt service on those other bonds. So we start with the West because Streetworks owns the West. And then as development progresses and Streetworks buys the North and South properties for the 10 plus million dollars, then we impose the assessment on that property as well. So we've got all, all three zones, um, or the, I'm sorry, the West and the South zones locked up uh, relative to the special assessment. Um, the term of the special assessment is important, right? Because it doesn't last forever, right? Once, once the project is stable, and cash flowing, um, ultimately the special assessment can burn off. So again, the point here was is to get us through project stabilization, which is proposed for 2030. But what we have developed with the developer is a mechanism where once the project um, achieves stabilization, which is 1.15 debt service, so assume $3 million of debt service, that's $3.45 million annually in project revenues. Once the project has produced that 3.45 million annually for three consecutive years, <clears throat> then the special assessment can burn off because they have reached a stabilization that the town um, can be comfortable with. If at any point during that three year period, they dip below that 1.15 times coverage, then the, because you know for whatever reason, then the, um, that three year clock starts all over again. So that um, special assessment could be in place for a significant period of time, but again, we all want project success, so we're hoping that it that it burns off ultimately three years after project stabilization. So this is sort of a summary, I hope, of some of the things that we've already talked about. Um, 
protecting the town is sort of paramount importance number one when it comes to issuing redevelopment area bonds. Um, there's a lot of good reasons why they're doing it, but we need to make sure that that risk is um, is mitigated. So again, as um, Councilwoman Habgood just mentioned, the special assessment really is a critical component to protect the town during the project's vulnerable time. And it's, as Bob Powell just mentioned, it's security that is well in excess and far more valuable than, than the exposure um, to the town on the bonds. The $8 million Streetworks investment up front is important for a couple of reasons. One, it shows project investment by Streetworks. The more money they put into this project, um, you know, the more they're going to get pushed to get it done. It also allows us to defer issuance of the third bond issue, the public improvement bond issue, so that again, we, we don't do it until certain metrics have been hit within the development, and we know that those, um, those revenues are going to come online. Um, $10.1 million purchase price for the 2.3 acres of town on land. Again, cash in hand is always a great security um, mechanism for any anyone. Um, and the fact that that's again getting paid, um, you know, on the earlier side relative to the planned uh, construction schedule is is good security for the town. Debt service coverage ratio, $73 million of debt service against $213 million of total revenue is off the charts debt service coverage relative to- Yeah, I mean, just, I'll, I'll just jump in, Matt, because, um, you know, in the um, transactions that I've worked on, you know, a debt service coverage ratio minimum of, you know, maybe like one three, one three five, something like that. I mean, we're getting close to three times here. Um, and you know, so when you say it's extraordinary, it, it really is. Uh, I mentioned earlier the pilot. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Anytime. Um, I mentioned the pilot revenue sufficiency test earlier. Again, we are consistently monitoring um, the interest rate at which bonds are issued. Assumed four percent, but if we issue them at less great, we know we have a cushion. If we issue them higher, then we have to start to cut, right? Because we're never going to exceed basically a, um, a debt service number that has been built into these models and that reflect the data that, that you've seen. Um, and that's an ongoing test that is that will be run multiple times um, as construction costs become known and as bond interest rates and debt service become known. And then again, conditions preceding to the issuance of each series of bonds are gonna rely on um, construction activity and investment by Streetworks. And then uh, finally, the first lien on their property, uh, both in terms of the uh, special assessment and also a pilot payment if it's not made, right? And Steve touched on this earlier, why sell versus lease? Lease is a contractual payment. The pilot is a, a payment that's subject to the to um, a first lien on property. So even if they fail to make a pilot payment when it's due, then um, the a lien triggers in the benefit to the benefit of the town. And that I, one of the questions that came through is what happens to these protections if uh, SWD files for bankruptcy? So I assume this this supplies, correct? Yeah. So again, that's a great example of why. Um, Pilots and special assessments, in my view, are a better mechanism than a contractual payment, right? A redeveloper payment or a lease payment, right? That lease is is going to get um, discharged or you know uh, addressed in bankruptcy. Um, failed pilot payments, failed special assessments have a higher priority. So I was trying for those that like watching to teams with losing records um, get done before the Monday Night Football game started, but uh, I think I just missed my target, so I apologize. Oh, you're close. And, um, and bear with me before I uh, wrap up. I just, there's a few questions that came in. Um, there seems to be some, uh, a, little, want a little bit more clarity about um, who, who pays for what and who's paying for the traffic mitigation. What, what is the, on the public improvements? Can you say specifically what part Streetworks is paying for and what specifically the, I know we outlined the public, but how those public improvements are being paid. What is the $8 million going toward? And for example, the who, how are the town green and the town square being, uh, being paid for and by whom? 
So, uh, Mayor, I'll, I'll try and tackle that one. Um, Jim, do you want to just put up that list again, the list of the public improvements real quick? That might help. Right. OK, so these public improvements, all of them, 54.2 million are being funded through a combination of the three bond issues I described, the $8 million that Streetworks is contributing, and a portion of the land sale purchase price paid to the town for the north and south zone lands. So all of that money is ag deposited, think of it into one account, and it will all go out to be spent on these, all of these enumerated public improvements, right? As the cash is collapsed basically into one account, <laughs> There isn't necessarily a perfect tracking of which go to which, but what we can say is the, um, where are the parking decks? North Avenue Public there. Parking Garage is its own bond issue. South Avenue Public Parking Garage is its own bond issue. Um, and the balance of these improvements, the town square, the town green, the technology, the traffic mitigation, all of those things are funded with the combination of the $8 million from Streetworks the third redevelopment area bond issue and a portion of the land sale proceeds. So dollars being fungible, it's a little difficult to say, but what I will say is the um, $8 million likely gets spent first, because again, we won't issue the third bond issue for quite some time. So the North Avenue Town Square is up front. The South Avenue Town Green is up front. The North Zone streetscape improvements and traffic mitigation are up front. So you can think of those things as being funded with the $8 million in Streetworks cash, because in terms of a flow in and out of funds, that money's coming in first and it's going to be going out first for those uh, and the mobility hub as well, those four or five improvements. And, and Matt, is it fair to say, I think originally the conversations were about, okay, Streetworks, you fund the North Green and or the North the North Town Square, the South Town Green. And our preference was just give us the cash up front so we have maximum flexibility on how and when that's deployed. Would you is that an accurate statement? I think it is. Again, I, I think it I think we we the town benefit from it in several ways and I and I've talked about them. So I do think it's um I think we were better off getting that money in hand, in pocket as an investment upfront from Streetworks, and then being able to deploy that money on a schedule that, you know, we are, we among others are comfortable with. Um, and the $8 million is issued six months after we break, they break ground on the West Zone. Isn't that correct? I think that's what's, that's my understanding. Um, and, um, and so, we well, just some other questions. I'm sorry, I'm looking at so, uh, my, sorry, I'm not looking, I'm looking at these questions. Um, can you give, uh, and to, I, Matt, I think this is you, a timeline for the public improvements and related cash inflow and outflow? Um, as a generally, yes. I mean, obviously these things are still sort of evolving, but um, the general idea is the first, outflow. The first inflow will be the issuance of the North parking deck garage bonds. And the first outflow will be those bond proceeds to pay for the North garage parking deck. The next inflow is the $8 million in public improvement contribution from Streetworks. And that goes out almost immediately over the course of, let's call it nine months to a year to undertake those public improvements, those four or five public improvements that I mentioned um, earlier. The next inflow is the bond proceeds from the issuance of the bonds to fund the South Avenue parking deck. And those bond proceeds go out over the next 12 to 18 months after that to fund the construction of the South parking deck. And then the uh, last inflow it, sorry, the one additional inflow is the third bond issue, which is issued nearer the end of construction to fund some of these additional public improvements. And importantly, the land acquisition price, right, the $10 million comes in, I skipped it, I apologize, after the North Parking Garage, but before the South Parking Garage. Yeah. Matt, I was just thinking that 
um, maybe as part of the follow up to this, we can put all of these things on a time on a slide that shows the timeline, um, because I, I think it is um, good. There have been other questions tonight about how long the overall process is going to take. So you know, we could also put some things in the timeline around when we expect stabilization to happen on the project and those kinds of things. It might be an easier way for everyone to look at it. Yeah, it was it was a great question. And I think I think it's going to be very easy to sort of through line graphs or otherwise provide a summary of data as to the inflows and outflows. Uh, it's a good question to ask and, and great data. for. And, and to that point, we are working on a graphic uh, as kind of a financials at a glance that could actually hopefully graphically re represent some of what you got what you all presented today. Um, I just did want to follow up on one thing about the public improvements. Um, the improvements also follow execution of the works and specifically related to traffic. So for example, when they follow the West Zone, we're not gonna wait till the entire project is done to do the traffic improvements on the West Zone because they're gonna be needed um, immediately in terms of some uh, enhancements to those intersections. So there's a, also a sequencing of the improvements relative to the construction schedule. Uh, um, okay, someone else asked, I just, um, someone asked a question, oh, about any, the, how will the town address increased operating costs for like police, fire, D DPW, if there is any. Um, so one thing Matt outlined that there's going to be $140 million in incremental um, revenue to the town beyond what we're, what we're using on debt service. So clearly there's going to be revenue to support that. But beyond that, we actually have... Um, commissioned a report by an expert uh, that does these types of assessments to determine um, what impact that the uh, any new residents or employees would have on the operations of the town. Um, on the residential side, the 354 residents, that, that figure came from them because there's a whole uh, uh, formula that they use to assess based upon the age restricted and so forth. Um, the 354 residents from this project in light of, you know, our population um, uh, growth, or I should say lack of growth, uh, does it, it feels like that could be easily absorbed, but we're waiting on the full final report from them, which will also be publicly issued and we'll be able to more better answer that question specifically, but there doesn't seem to be any concern that it's going to significantly impact resources of the town and any, any impact could easily be handled by the financial benefit of the project. Uh, I'm looking, I'm, Kim, is there anything else? Yeah, I, I see a question here regarding the uh, ability for street work to sell off their rights to the project. So both the redevelopment agreement and the financial agreement in this case are both gonna have restrictions on transfers. Um, redevelopment agreement with respect to during the pendency of the actual construction and redevelopment and the financial agreement for the term of that financial uh, tax exemption, which is going to limit, except for what is built into those agreements as permitted transfers, any, any uh, transfer of control of the redevelopment entity without uh, the town's blessing. And another question came out just about um, timing and length of construction from beginning to end. Uh, I, Matt, I don't know if you've got, or who's got the sequencing in front about, uh, clearly the West Zone would start first and I think that would be later 24. Um, and, and I think the West Zone, which is the Lord and Taylor component is a fairly self-contained. So that's a project that will be able to probably have um, uh, I, I don't the most limited impact I think on on uh, you know process projects and process around the town. Um, but uh, do you have do you happen to know Matt? What the, I don't know what the latest schedule is. I think it ends in twenty eight. Is that right? Beginning in late twenty four. Yeah, it, it's uh, Mayor. It's about four years of, mm -hmm. of um, construction, right? Getting the the ramp up, getting approvals, things like that. But um, basically, mid twenty twenty four to mid twenty twenty eight. And because it will be sequenced, it's not like the whole town will be construction and under construction at once. As I said, the West Zone being 
um, fairly self-contained, and then then the north side, and then ultimately the south side. And I'll just say this one thing to note about the mass timber construction. Um, it's prefabricated and it doesn't have steel. It's actually much uh, quicker and much um, less uh, uh, in <laughs> intrusive. Yeah, exactly. Way. Uh, it's less time consuming, less intrusive, and it's obviously a more sustainable way to build. So um, so related to the south side too, that's a good that's a good thing on the construction side. That's by, by the way, Mayor, that's also true about the two parking garages. They will largely be prefabricated um, and brought to the site in in pieces. So it's not going to be a long on-site construction process there either. Uh, so anybody else see anything that maybe wasn't covered? And I'll just say this. Um, this presentation tonight will be a replayed always on our town's Facebook page, my Facebook page, as well as on the town's website. We'll also be posting the slides of this presentation on the website. Um, as we mentioned, this is a lot of information. Uh, there's a lot of rabbit holes that we can go down on financials, but we hope we wanted to avoid them tonight to give everybody a general conceptual understanding of the financials that are being negotiated. And so please read, process, review, and send us any additional questions in advance of the January 11th Facebook Live, and we'll do our best to, um, to answer all of them. Again, you can submit questions in advance. Uh, and we're also, as I mentioned, we're putting together a fairly comprehensive list of finance FAQs. Um, some have already been done, but we'll incorporate some of the questions that we received this evening, this evening if they're not already um, in there. And uh, we hope to be, we will post them this week and we'll constantly be updating them with new uh, new questions as they're available. I do want to remind everybody, we did just post some new questions uh, this, whack, this week related to traffic um, and a few, other, uh, a few other questions that have come through. So, and we, and we note on the FAQs, which ones are new. So please just uh, circle back on those and see, um, see and, and you know, for new information and always submit. Um, and again, you know, always reach out to me or any of our, any of your, uh, your count, your ward council persons. We're happy to talk to any of you at any time. I'm happy to meet people in the preview center as, or any of them to give personal tours and answer questions. I've done that multiple times. So um, please, uh, it, as I said, many times it's just really important to all of us that the public is informed um and uh and so that your feedback is credible and it's based upon facts and so that's why the more informed you can be the better you can uh the better the better ultimately the project will become and you know i know streetworks was not part of this i and i do want to remind people we are often refer to them as the developers but they are a property owner too so they have a, a very vested interest in what we're discussing tonight and um, this numbers will evolve as the project evolves, um, uh, but the, out, the risk mitigation measures that have been negotiated so hard by the team here are, are all set. And so there might be some fine tunings on numbers as things evolve, but the risk mitigation measures will remain the same. So um, I don't know if anyone has anything else to add before we conclude. All good. Well, I want to thank Councilman Hapgood, Matt, Bob, Steve, and Jim and Kim behind the scenes, um, and for everybody that has uh, really, hopefully, the um, I hope it was very apparent the level of, uh, of scrutiny and um, detail and commitment has gone into these conversations to date. Uh, we look forward to hearing from the public. Um, and getting your questions, and uh, we will we will be back in January. And uh, I hope and we wish thank all of you and wish everybody the happiest of holidays. You're here. Thank you, everyone. It was really yeah, a good night. Day.